Um, have you ever seen me speak, you know I go flying through lots of tactics very, very quickly. I have a link at the end, don't worry. It shows where all the stuff is. I tweet it out too, so you don't have to be frantically taking pictures of slides or anything. It's all good. Um, how many people here get reviews, like performance reviews at work, or get client reviews or anything like that? Don't worry, I can't see you, so you can raise your hand at Petrend or whatever you want to do. Um, how many of you on those performance reviews have a line that says, created unicorns? How about, was a unicorn? No? How about, helped a client sell shit? Probably more, right? created good content, did their jobs, things like that. Unicorns never show up. But we're always told, create unicorns, be unicorns, act like unicorns, facilitate unicorns. And so we go out and we go to clients or we go to our boss or whatever and we say, I need this budget, this unicorn sized budget. And in response, we get, a chihuahua budget. So we go to our clients and we go to our boss and we say this, and we say, you know what, for this blog post, it's gonna cost about $1,500. And they freak out, $1,500? I can get 15 blog posts for that much. So then we say, okay, let's do one really good piece of content. Uh, for that, it'll cost $50,000. And they give you $1,500 and a 2005 laptop uh, to show their generosity. Um, so then we say, okay, maybe at least you could give me the unicorn schedule. So it's gonna take me six weeks to create this, and we'll have to do the research very carefully, and we'll do all this other stuff, and at the end of the six weeks, we'll have this magnificent thing. And they say, no, what we really need is a herd of chihuahuas. Is it a herd, a riot, a pack? I don't know. We need the herd of chihuahuas. We're all smart people, you're all smart people. I mean, you're all here. Right? Why do we keep asking for these things when we always get the opposite? Every single time. I mean, maybe once in a while, you know, in some organization, big or small, someone comes to you and says, yeah, you know what? We're gonna give you $40,000. Please create that one piece of content that breaks the mold and does incredible stuff. It happens, right? And it's fantastic when it does. But sometimes I gotta think, we're trying to be the wrong animals. And so what I say, and the whole, what I'm gonna say today, and I want you all to like tweet it or whatever, is to hell with the unicorns. We need to be badgers, okay? More badgers, fewer unicorns. And there's some good reasons for this, okay? Badgers are really efficient. They adapt. They don't require a ton of stuff. Unicorns require tons of food, and by the way, only maidens can approach them. I'm not a maiden. Most of my clients aren't maidens, I'm assuming, which kind of causes problems because no one can take care of them. Also, while the badgers are out there getting shit done, the unicorns frolic. And frolicking is great, but it doesn't really get work done. Plus, unicorns have to be rescued by Tom Cruise in really cheesy 1980s movies. This is a movie called Legend. And it's funny, because when I watched it in the 80s, I thought this is the greatest thing ever, and I showed it to my kids about two months ago, and they just looked at me at the end like this. <laughs> and I, had, I didn't remember that the unicorn had the horn taped onto it, so when it was running around, the horn was bouncing. It turns out it was. So anyway, unicorns, no unicorns, all right? The hell with the unicorns, we need badgers. There is no question we need more badgers. Badgers thrive independently. When I say independently, I don't necessarily mean that everybody is on a team of one. I know some of you get to work on bigger teams, you're in Fortune 500 companies, whatever. It just means that you work in conditions where you have a smaller team than you would like. What you're gonna see is a big theme of all of this, right? We're always working with teams that are smaller than we would like. We're always getting slightly less stuff than we would like. So the badgers chase away the unicorns pretty easily in spite of much smaller size. And they get into situations like this with content calendars, right? H how many people here, you create the beautiful content calendar? It's perfect, it has everything laid out, it's all synchronized. Every idea, every concept, blog posts, backup, you know, 
cornerstone content, which back up tweets, which back up Facebook posts. And then things start to sort of happen, right? Maybe a product launch gets delayed. Maybe uh, you know, a few things get deleted by legal or brand. Maybe someone decides some stuff should be moved around. And then maybe there's a few things that you know, the product department gets involved and they say, hey, let's call it this instead. And then, of course, people start editing, right? So you've got the post ready to go live. And they say, you know what? We, Microsoft just released this new font. We really want to use that. Well, if you're a unicorn, if you're trying to create a unicorn, you're kind of out of luck. Not much you can do. Badger's got this. Because Badgers understand that when you're on your own, you're on a small team, structure is way more important than planning. OK? Any calendar you create is going to go to hell in a hurry. There is no way around that, OK? And it's not because people are bad or they're not listening to you or something like that. It's because what you created the calendar for now is going to change about 60 seconds from now. Right? We all know that. So structure is way more important. And at Portent, we look at things from the perspective of content types. All right? And this has worked really well for us. So there's three basic categories of content for us. If you're a skier or a mountain biker, you know what these are. Um, I had forgotten what some of these were when I was mountain bike racing, and I came up on a sign, and I said, I wonder what two black diamonds mean, and went right off the edge. It was, it was sad. Um, so green circle is any content, whether it's a single tweet, one sentence, a Facebook post, a blog post, or a full ebook. It's whatever content you can create once or twice a week, maybe more times. Blue square, again, whether it's a Facebook tweet, a blog post, something else, is content you can create probably once a month. Black diamond is content you can create maybe once a quarter, once every six months. Maybe it's still a tweet, in which case I'm kind of sorry. That's kind of sad, but hopefully it's more. And that creates this basic structure, right? So instead of having to create this perfect calendar, you create these categories. And you say, all right, we're going to create this content. And here's the general concepts. And then you also have levels of branding, right? So you have lightly branded content, where the only part of your brand in there is how to do something. So you know, the, all the, the only part of your brand is the template that surrounds it. So maybe you have a blog post or an ebook on how to cook radishes. I've never cooked radishes. It sounds disgusting, but it popped into my head. Uh, so lightly branded content. Moderately branded would answer the question, but using your product. So here's how you cook radishes using our radish cooker. Heavily branded content is the sales pitch. It just says, buy our radish cooker. You don't even have to learn how to cook radishes if you use our radish cooker. It will cook perfect radishes. Now that we're done with that disgusting metaphor. Um, what this creates for you is this structure. And you can say, all right, here's how much lightly branded content we're going to create. Moderately branded, heavily branded. You see how much heavily branded content you're creating? Right? When you're thinking about unicorns, they're always creating 80% lightly branded content or whatever else. I think instead, it's 80% of the effort goes into the lightly branded content. You're always going to have much more heavily branded, because let's face it, no matter what kind of content you do, at some point, you got to write the product descriptions. You got to write the services pages. You got to put the stuff out there that sells, because your job is not to create unicorns. You're not going to get reviewed on that. You're going to get reviewed based on selling stuff. So you got heavily branded home pages and heavily branded product pages and heavily branded category pages. All of this stuff that has to somehow get out there. That's why there is so much heavily branded content, but why it's all green circle. Not a whole lot of approval required. It's just going to get right out there. So you can go to Google and use Google Suggest and everything. And by the way, this is how this whole talk, this was the genesis, is my Patronus, as it turns out, is a badger. Um, I had hoped for you know, an elk or a dragon, but it's a badger, which it turns out is probably OK. So this, that's how this talk started. I was going to do don't create unicorns, create dragons. OK, badgers. So now you got your structure. It's time to find ideas, right? Everybody says, we've got to go find some cool ideas. Well, what do you generally do? In a lot of organizations, a lot of conferences you'll hear, you need to brainstorm. Create the brainstorming session. Put a whole bunch of people in a room, get them all talking. There are no wrong ideas, and just write them all down. 
Well, if you're a badger, that pisses you off, all right? Because content, and I'm sorry if I'm offending people on this one, content is not a democracy, all right? It is not a democracy. It can't be. You don't have time. So badgers don't necessarily do the big brainstorming session, certainly not when you're producing green circle content every week. The other thing is you're drowning in ideas. You don't need more ideas. You've got tons of ideas. What you need to do is pick one. I work with so many people who have these incredible lists of ideas, and somehow none of it ever goes live. And you think, what, what's happening here? So you can go to answer the public, I'm sure you all know about this, and get new ideas. But before you do that, look at your support forums. What are the threads that get the most attention and participation? Maybe you should answer those. This is for a software product called Moodle. It's a training software, and one of the most visited, commented on, and viewed threads on the entire uh, support forum is questions about installing this extension called Solar, which is a search tool. So if I were them, I'd write a blog post about installing Solar on Moodle. If you don't know what this means, just avoid eye contact and quietly move on. Doesn't really matter, okay? Point here is you can go to Stack Overflow and look for the stuff that's getting the most traffic, the most votes, the most comments, the most views. Answer those. By the way, I can give you the answer to both of these if you want later. Um, I'm not gonna do that here. If you do slide decks and put them up on SlideShare, find the slides that get clipped. Find the slides that get clipped the most. If you've got slides that get clipped a lot, like that, I know three people, look, I, I, I'm, I'm a D-lister here, okay? G give me a break. Um, then you can do a blog post on how to use Hemingway. Right, there's some interest there. If you do big white papers, sorry for the atrocious color choice there. Uh, if you do white papers, take chunks out of the white paper. Generally, there's gonna be whole sections of the white paper that no one will read, because it's a white paper. So people skim the first part and the last part, and if there's a word like transformation in there, they go for it, otherwise, forget it. Uh, take those chunks of the white paper and turn those into blog posts. What are you doing there? You're accomplishing a few things. You're teasing the white paper, and you're getting ideas that you know are at least important to your organization, and you can use those to post. Plus, the content's already there. All you have to do is rewrite it. Take a blog post and pull tweets out of it, right? Just take something from the post, if the post got attention, and turn it into a tweet. That's all you gotta do. You don't have to look for new ideas. Finding new ideas is really cool. You wanna get them and do them, but 90% of the time you don't have to do that. And badgers know that, they know better. Right, the unicorn thing is to always find the biggest, newest idea, or take an existing idea and so revolutionize it that it's unrecognizable. You don't have to do that. Now you got your idea, it's time to get to work. If you're doing a blog post, you're generally just gonna go zipping right into WordPress, right? Do your post, put it out there. If you're doing something else, you probably need an HTML producer. How many people here create, produce, design, and publish your own content, all on your own? And yeah, not that many. Um, so most of us go to a production team and say, hey, production team, I've got this cool piece of content. Do you mind if you could, could you do some work on this for me? And you hop on the production team and say, yeah, sweet. I'm pretty sure this is Photoshop. I don't think anyone actually did this with their child. Um, that would be hideous uh, for both of them. Um, and the, the production team says, you know, we're doing a million things. Maybe it's one person. Maybe it's 40 people, and 40, or 39 of them are busy, and the 40th hates you because you corrected their spelling on Twitter in front of the entire world. Whatever, you can't get the production team to help out. Unicorns will often say, okay, well, this is a really awesome idea, so we're gonna work on it 
we'll start writing it, we'll do some cool stuff, and, and you know, when you're ready, we'll get it published, and then we will cavort amongst the beautiful content that we have created. I'm exaggerating a little here, okay, y'all, it's just work with it, work with the analogy. Third rule for Badger style content is you use what you have, not what you wish you had. Again, in any organization, no matter how big, we are always gonna get slightly less than we think we need to do a good job, always. It always feels that way. What you need to do in those situations is find another way to get it done. So, and this is where I'm gonna dive kinda deep. If you don't have a producer, you need to learn to work in plain text. You need to learn to use a language called Markdown. Don't, don't tune me out yet. It's a really simple language, okay? And there's some really powerful reasons. So why on earth would you do this to yourself? First thing is you're using text editors instead of Microsoft Word, all right? I have never had a text editor just crash and lose all my work or screw up my work or start doing weird overlaps of text or substituting fonts or you know, giving me messages saying normal.dot cannot be found, whatever. Never had a text editor do that. You can convert Markdown. I'm gonna show you how to do it in a second. It's only gonna take four slides to show you how to do Markdown. You can convert Markdown to just about anything, okay? Word docs, HTML, PDF, slides, audio. I don't know about audio, actually. That might be an exaggeration, but lots of really nifty things. And you can edit text anywhere you want. This is on my phone sitting on the plane writing this as the person next to me edges further and further away as they're reading what I'm writing. You'll be able to open it 20 years from now. If we are still reading text, this will still be content that you can open because it is plain text. It is completely backwards compatible forever. If it's not, we have other things to think about. And most important, you can generate flawless HTML and this is why you need to learn it. If you're one of the people in here who did not raise your hands, which is a lot of you, when I asked if you have your own production team, you need to know how to do this because this will help you take one more thing off of the production team's plate so that every time you produce a green circle piece of content, you don't have to go to them and then wait a week for your content to go live. So you write in Markdown and all you do is some really simple things. So, a little hash symbol, a pound symbol, creates a one level one heading. Two creates a level two heading. You want to create a link? Two brackets for the text, two parentheses for the link. That's it. A list? Use asterisks. Or just use numbers if you want a numbered list. That's all you have to do. Put in an image, slightly different from a link. Just add an exclamation point at the beginning. You can preview it in a whole bunch of different tools like Marked, 2 on uh, the Mac, or Dillinger on the web, whatever. And you can also convert it using those tools. And if you're a serious nerd, I always use this for nerds. I don't know why. Um, you can use a tool called Pandoc. Very simple command line thing. But you don't have to learn that, okay? You can do all this with a basic text editor and one of those Markdown preview tools. And it generates HTML so good that I actually get tears in my eyes. Because I don't have to write it anymore. Back when I was a kid, I had to use Notepad to write HTML by hand. You don't have to do that anymore. It turns those H1s and H2s to perfect H1s and H2s. It turns links into links. It turns lists into lists, right? You don't have to know how any of this works. You're just getting flawless HTML out of it. And yes, there's places where it goes horrifically wrong and breaks and things, but no more often than Microsoft Word goes horrifically wrong and breaks and things. In fact, a lot less often than Microsoft Word will do that to you. It even, this is a personal thing for me, creates smart quotes. So in your post or whatever else, you'll get the little curly quotes instead of the stupid straight quotes that drive me crazy because from a typography standpoint, they're a nightmare. And you really only need two tools to do this, Sublime Text and Marked. And it can be any text editor you want. I just happen to love Sublime Text. And then Mark II or Dillinger. And then if you want to be the llama, go for Pandoc. Same time, you've got to use the right stock photos, okay? This is, this is where things go horribly wrong. 
people always seem to pick the perfectly racially integrated room full of disturbingly attractive people. Generally, if they have water glasses, all the water glasses are filled to the same level. Check, look for that sometime. The only thing realistic here is nobody is looking at or paying attention to the person running the meeting. That is the only thing realistic here, right? They're all looking away from that person. Some smart ass made a remark in the back, I've never done that, and they're all ignoring her. You can see the look on her face, right? She's about to say, what the hell are you doing? Please stop. Then there's Biff here, right? Really accessible, manly white dude. And he starts showing up all over the place. You know what the one thing men apparently want more than sex is? Well, it's either inlays and onlays on your teeth, or it's hair transplants. Personally, I, I can relate. But to pay for either of those, you got to get some tips on uh, Forex trading so you can get some easy money. So there he is again. The point here isn't that some smart ass is going to go and search the internet trying to find all the times that your picture has been used. The point is, that is a generic picture, right? It works here and here and here. Or rather, it works equally badly in all of these situations. That is not going to create any good content, unicorn or badger. What I like to do is try for analogies. If you're trying to explain something to your audience, like a crowd, you could just use a picture of a crowd. The truth is, this isn't a bad image. Or you could use a different kind of crowd. You probably know I use animal pictures quite a bit. <laughs> Hard to guess. Or a crowd. Or if you want to show someone really freaking out, Go for something completely random, like a freaking out chicken. By the way, featherless chicken, I cannot unsee that from this morning. It's <laughs> burned into my brain. I will have nightmares about it tonight. And you can put your own touch on it, right? You can add a speech balloon or you know, put the kid on top of the screaming badger and it doesn't have to look that perfect. Whatever it is, again, you're taking what's available and you're doing something cool with it. It doesn't take very long to find the picture of another kind of crowd. Just please don't use the stock photo that shows the printed circuit. That's been used before a million or so times. And by the way, I have done it too. All right, Don't sit here being embarrassed. I've done it so many. Look back over my blog posts over the years. Biff is there, OK? The, the, the perfectly balanced boardroom is there. All those things are there. I think I have one of a guy using a megaphone. He's hopped up on a table, and he's like smiling and screaming. And then there's a woman sitting in front of him. And she's like, and she's smiling too. And you're thinking, what, what is happening here? I don't know. I don't know. You do need to have a way to prep images. So again, you don't have that big production team. right? And again, it doesn't matter. 2000, Fortune 2000 company team of one, team of 50, you just, if you're doing images, you have to send those to someone else to get them done. That's an entire loop, right? You have to send it to someone, they have to do it, they have to send it back and say, okay, it's good to go, and then you're good to publish. You can't just go in and say, okay, we're good to go. So have a basic image prep workflow. I don't like stock photos, I also don't like plagiarism. You know, use some of these sources. So Pexels and Unsplash are free. Uh, iStock is a screaming deal. Shutterfly as well. I know they seem expensive, but like with iStock, you can pay a flat fee a month and get 300 downloads every month. You can just download them and save them so you can use them later or whatever. I didn't say that. Keep the originals, all right? You're going to resize images. You're going to mess with them. You're going to crop them. Keep the originals. Inevitably, the number of times that people ask you to modify the original is directly proportional to the number of times that you delete the original. All right? Don't do that so many times. And going back into iStock or on Pexels and trying to find that image again is not fun. Keep a double, uh, a double sized image. Resolution doesn't matter, just for all the nerds here. Um, Keep a double-sized version of the image for retina displays. 
the super high-res displays like on all the Macs that I see here and a lot of PCs now. And compress your images. This is the easiest thing in the world to do. Anyone who works at Portent right now is looking at me like, oh my god, Ian, again? We have to hear about this again? It is so easy to compress an image, all right? On the Mac, you use Preview. On the PC, you use something like Cesium. You can take it from 5 meg to 661 kilobytes, whatever, and it will load that much faster. Handle colors on your own. Now, I am a color moron, all right? I have the color sensitivity of a badger, probably. I can't really go to clients and say, so, hey, client, or hey, boss, I have no color sense, but you gave me the job of making sure this looks good, so can you give me some ideas for color palettes? Uh, that doesn't go over well with clients. If there are any clients here, I never, I will never do that to you. Use something like Canva's color palette generator. All right, go on there, take, a, take some painting or something. We have this at home, I've always loved it. The closer you look at it, the more detail there is, it's amazing. Um, take a screen capture of it or a photo and just feed it into this palette generator and it generates the palette for you. So quick aside, since we're talking about editing, I actually know that a honey badger is not a badger. All right, so you can all stop tweeting it now. How many people here were tweeting, come on, when I first showed the honey badger, how many people here immediately tweeted, that's not a badger? Nobody? I'm checking Twitter later, so if you did, you may as well tell me. No? Okay. Good. Good. Uh, so the next thing is you have to edit, and everybody always says, get someone else to edit your work. I say it too. How often do we have a chance to get someone else to edit our work? Not real often. And even if we do, it's a lot nicer to the editor to hand them something that you have already edited. I can tell you as someone who edits work, it is easier to edit good work than to edit crap. There is nothing worse than getting something on your desk looking at it and saying, I, I don't know where to start with this. This is a catastrophe. So edit it yourself first. And you can do that all sorts of good ways when the editor looks at you like this, which does happen. You need to create your own workflow. The way I do it is I start with this app called Hemingway, which you probably all already know about. Uh, the only advice I'll give here is don't take it at face value. Uh, <laughs> If you actually cut and paste some text by Hemingway into this app, uh, it gets it all wrong. It gives he Ernest Hemingway himself like an F. So just let it mark where you can and cannot or where you have sentences that are difficult or easy. Use that first, then read it backwards a paragraph at a time. That sounds ridiculous, I know. But read it backwards a paragraph at a time. I'm not talking about Twin Peaks kind of, you know, weird talking. I'm nerding out, sorry. Uh, then go to Grammarly and use Grammarly to edit it. Get rid of all your typos, all your bad grammar, everything else. You don't have to get a 100 because there's always going to be something you're doing in there it doesn't like. And then read it backwards a sentence at a time. The purpose of reading it backwards is taking all of this stuff out of the context where you have read it many times and you're just, you're completely blind to it. I will sometimes read it a word at a time backwards, but I'm not gonna do that with a 10,000 word long form post, so you know, everybody has to just have their own limits, that's mine. Then go have lunch, again, honey badger, okay? It's a weasel, not a badger. You have now learned something from my presentation. And then understand, you've got a lot to do at some point, you gotta just publish. And I've seen content get stuck into this kind of eternal loop of tweak this a little bit, change that a little bit, and we don't have much control over that as content creators, not always. But there are ways to help move things along. So you've got your content and you're ready to go live, right? But then all of a sudden legal, legal shows up. They're a little prickly sometimes. I have a law degree, okay, so I just, And then engineering shows up. They also can be a little prickly. And then branding shows up. And it has to go through all these stages of review. Those can become serious holdups. Your content can be unrecognizable when it comes out the other end. <laughs> I've had stuff that looked like it got recycled through a badger or through a unicorn. Um, 
you can make it much easier on those teams. And there's a few things to do. First of all, you, you do have to understand, be a little empathetic there. They have jobs too. All right, I have done content review a long, long time ago uh, as an intern in law school. And you know we're supposed to do it too. And we have a stack this high on our desks. So you can do a couple things to make our lives easier. Same with branding, same with everybody else. First of all, give us the idea first. Long before you start, or if you, ha you, know, if you don't have that opportunity, the day you start writing, email me the idea. Not a summary, nothing else. Just say, hey, I'm going to write about this thing. Is that OK? Generally, lawyers will say no, because that's our job. No, it's not OK. If you do it, I wash my hands of it. Um, if you've never heard that, you're not working in a big enough company, probably. Uh, send them that one idea. Make sure it's OK. Then edit your work before you send it to them. All right. Nothing flashes an enormous middle finger at the legal team or the branding team or the engineering team than giving them a piece of content that's impossible to read because it's horrifically badly written. Or giving them a video that's impossible to watch because it still has all the places where it says, no, 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 go back, edit that, forget it. Make sure that you give them something that's easier to get through. And then finally, and this is a trick I've found works really well, create one large piece of content and let them know this is going to be a series of posts. This is going to be a series of videos. We're going to break this up. This is going to be a bunch of tweets. You're not tricking them. It's much easier to focus if you get one thing. You know, just tapping my own experience here, I worked on a, on a law journal, a little one. I wasn't like on the Harvard Law Review or something. Uh, and we would get these articles. And getting one big article and working through it was much faster than if the writer sent us one chunk at a time. Right? Because you just get focused. So try to piggyback content. If you are creating a bunch of blog posts, put them together into one big post. Be thematic. And it's possible that one of those folks, the lawyer, the engineer, the product person, actually wrote out a series of rules. If you ask them for that, they are going to swoon with joy. They will be so happy and excited that you ask them, because no one ever does. They will be very, very happy. Or start writing down what you hear so you don't have to keep asking. Keep your own little help desk of all this stuff. So now you got your content, right? Time to relax. This is not a dead badger. This is actually a resting badger. I checked. There are many pictures of dead badgers by the side of the road uh, on iStock. I, I didn't use any of them. Um, it feels like it's time to just stop, right? But you're not done, OK? Badgers don't let go of things. They keep working at them. What you want to do is repurpose the hell out of your content. Repurpose it constantly. Waste nothing. So just as an example, this is what actually led to this presentation. I did this post. This was a rant. And I did a slide deck that was eight little things to make your blog post better. And it got 50,000 views on SlideShare, which it got my attention. Okay, And it actually got some slides clipped, <laughs> which was exciting too. Uh, and I said, OK, there's something here. Let's keep going with it. I did a blog post. It didn't bomb exactly, but it didn't exactly light the world on fire either. 1,500 views, OK. Unique views. So then I took a look at doing a webinar, did that. I think we had like 1,200 views or something like that. Again, exciting, not the most exciting thing I've ever seen. Then I repurposed it into an ebook, which took a lot of work. But that got us so far 350 quality leads leads worth reaching out to. You know, this is typical inbound marketing. That worked really well. So we repurposed it four times. We got 50,000 views on SlideShare. We got 350 leads. If you ignore everything in between, this was still a success. And I didn't repeat any work. And if I had been writing a separate ebook on a separate topic, it would have taken much, much longer. There are other kinds of media, too. Right? There's always other kinds of media. So maybe you want to do video. Maybe you want to do audio. And this, again, is where you get into kind of this badger mode, because of course, you're going to hear, no, no, don't have the time. It's too expensive. Forget it. We can't do this. We've got to get an outside resource, whatever else. The truth is, 
you don't have to. There are tools out there like uh, Soapbox by Wistia, and I think Phil Cunningham's gonna show this to you uh, later on, maybe tomorrow, I'm not sure. Um, Nottingham, not Cunningham. Why should I say Phil Cunningham? His name is Phil Nottingham. Sorry, Phil. Um, you can take a tool like Wistia's Soapbox and you can easily do your face as a talking head and your screen right next to each other. And it's a simple web-based tool. It takes a couple of minutes. It's easy. You don't need to go and get another team. It'll still need to go through legal. It'll still need to go through engineering. still need to go through everything else. It's going to take some time to get your boss to really think about it. But you can do it. And that's what this really gets down to as I kind of wrap this up. There's always a way to do this stuff. All right? You're always going to get a little bit less than what you really want without fail. But there's always a way to get this done. And by the way, I have very high expectations of marketers. Okay? I look at you all and I know you can do this stuff. And I have very high expectations and I write blog posts about things like all marketers should be developers, all marketers should know how to edit images, all this kind of stuff. When I talk about that, I don't necessarily mean you have to be the best developer ever. You don't have to be Ernest Hemingway. You don't have to be a master with Photoshop. You just have to be good enough at it to find a way, because badgers find ways to get shit done. It's, just, it's how they work. They'll take 30 minutes now to learn the tool that's going to save them an hour for every single piece of content they ever do again. Right, you're going to do that. No matter how pressed you feel for time, it's worth doing. Badgers don't try to alter their environment that often. So you're going to go out and you're going to work with, you're going to go into new organizations. And I am the worst at this. You, you suffer from this thing called first professional syndrome, where you walk into a room and you feel like you're the first person to have ever known what they're doing in that room. I have bad news for you, um, and I fail at this all the time. You have to understand that there's actually some people before you who have some qualifications. Chances are. All right? You at least have to start with that understanding. Understand that going in and immediately throwing things into an uproar may not be the best way to start. Badgers don't do that. Okay? They tweak things a little bit at a time. They know the constraints under which they have to work. Right? Unicorns, the unicorn approach is to immediately go way, way, way outside what's been done before and do radical stuff, which is awesome, but we don't get to do it that very often. Badgers know their constraints and they're always pushing at them a little bit, right? You're using Markdown so you don't have to do your H, so that someone else doesn't have to do your HTML. You're producing a few more things than the legal team is used to. You're using a few more images or a few fewer images and you're just improving on things a little bit every single time so that you create lasting change in the environment which you also adapt to at the same time. And you never stop. All right? You never stop refining and streamlining and accelerating and finding ways to do this better. You're always looking at ways to do a little better at this. And it's kind of a, a, a meta content approach, right? So even as whether you're a copywriter or a Photoshop person, a developer, even as you're doing your day-to-day -day work and your head down, you're always finding ways to do a little better at it every time. And yeah, someday you're going to have that bigger team. And this is a big thing about this presentation is I talk a lot about this and it seems like I'm talking about you know, teams of one. This is designed for very small teams, but a team of 50 can bog down in process and end up being a victim of its own size. And that's when you have to think like a badger again. Which is what this really all boils down to. I'm actually going to get some of these made, I think, and put them somewhere. This is what this all boils down to is People will come to you when you get stuck, if you're trying to create that unicorn piece, and they'll say, oh, you know, well, don't take it personally. It's just your work. This is seriously personal shit. If it's not personal, you should not be doing this work. All right? That doesn't mean you need to be a diva or have a temper tantrum, though. It means you just constantly chip away, and you find ways to do awesome, awesome stuff when the world around you is kind of resistant to that. And you just keep chipping away until you do, do that awesome shit, until your organization is producing that awesome shit. That's what badgers do. Thanks.